Um, great, so I'm going to be giving a talk on the API documentation style guide and the trials and tribulations of creating it. So let's say you're a technical writer with some API experience, and you start out at a new company with an API that's been around the block a few times. There's been a large variety of different developers and stakeholders and technical writers that have been contributing to it over time. And you've got to jump right into a pretty cluttered issues repo on day one and start shipping changes. And let's say this company is called Shopify and that the technical writer is me. It's me, I am the technical writer. I am Sherlock Holmes. Uh, but in all seriousness, you might feel a little bit like Sherlock Holmes in this situation, poking around in the dark, looking for clues, and trying to find a way forward to documenting this API in a consistent manner. So today in my talk, I'm going to go over what I went through during this journey to write an API style guide at Shopify that would work for us. And so hopefully, if you ever have to write an API style guide at your company one day, there may be a few things that we picked up along the way that might be helpful for you. So a little bit of a roadmap for the talk. We're gonna deep dive a little bit into API resources and what is it about them that makes them so hard to document. We're gonna talk about the perils of not writing with a style guide. Don't do it. A little bit about GraphQL for those of you that have multiple API technologies to document. And then I'll end with a little bit of a playbook to give you some concrete steps that you can take. So this is an excerpt from an issue that I, that I happened upon in our repo on day one or day two or something of my job. There's some weird stuff happening in the API reference sidebar. Some of the resources are in camel case without spaces. Others are in sentence case with spaces. Some are in between. Two of them are plural, order risks and abandoned checkouts, and the rest are singular. The name of one resource is cut off. <laughs> I felt so resigned and, and sad when I read that last sentence. You know, I love the construction of this issue. That last little sentence, it just really kind of turns the, it turns the knife. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I can do this. I am the technical writer. I've been hired at this company. I can fix this. I can do this. This should be easy. I'm going to go in. Some of them have an S at the end. They're plural. They shouldn't be. They should be singular. Um, there's a space with this one, the other ones don't have spaces. Some of them are in upper camel case without spaces. So let's just all figure out what we're gonna do and then we'll do it and we'll close the issue and we can all go out and have some beer. That wasn't really the way that, that things ended up going down. Um, and well, why is that? It has something to do with resources. So let's just pull back a little bit and we'll do a little bit of a, a 360 on resources and casing conventions for APIs. So what are resources even? So resources are kind of like the stuff that the API is, is made up of. And they're typically available at endpoints and they're stored in collections. So if you'd like to manipulate or work with the order resource in the Shopify API, you'll get that at the orders endpoint working with the orders collection. And the resources themselves are made up of properties or attributes, depending on what word you like to choose. And the, that's what the resources are, are comprised of. So you have your integers, you have your strings, you have your enums, you have your booleans, all this stuff that enables you to manipulate the resources to your heart's content on the API. And a little bit about casing conventions. So earlier in the slide, you might have noticed that we use upper camel case when we describe resources, and that we actually have that baked right into the navigation of our API documentation. So when it comes to naming resources in a program, there are three main types of case conventions. Camel case, snake case, and spinal case. And, and these are simply just a way of naming resources to resemble natural language while avoiding spaces, apostrophes, and other um, exotic characters. And so why is that important to understand? Well, in, in order for me to understand the best way forward in terms of how we were going to write about our APIs, and how we were gonna surface our APIs into some kind of comprehensible navigation, I needed to know a little bit about the rules around casing and, and case convention. Okay, so let's deep dive a little bit more into this. 
resources. Why are resources so hard? Pluralizations. So as I mentioned earlier, you access the price rule or the order or the collection or whatever the name is in, in your API, singular resource, at a plural collection. So when it comes to start writing about these things, you can be tempted to want to start writing about them in the plural, like you can create price rules with entitlements and prerequisites. There's no such thing as a price rules in the API. There is a price rule. That is the name of the resource. So it's, it's kind of inaccurate to write it like that. I think as a developer, you're looking, if you see something that is in spinal case or snake case or camel case, you think that is the thing. That's what I have to interact with. So sometimes as a writer, you can kind of get tripped up just with the rules of grammar when you want to write a sentence that is in the plural. The, um, the convention we came up with was we would use the word resource or, or object in the sentence. So you can create price rule objects with entitlements and prerequisites. But this was one of the things that made uh, coming up with a, with a comprehensive sidebar very difficult for us. Subresourcing. So the whole issue of subresourcing in an API. You can see here that in our API, we have the concept of parent resources and child resources. So if you'd like to access the risk resource, you can do so as a child of the order resource. And you can see that the convention that we used in our documentation was that we would use a space. So that way, it's easy to, to, to see that, oh, OK, there is such a thing as an order, and there is such a thing as a risk, and I can a access this risk at an order. If we were to put them together, you would think, oh, OK, there is a, there is a resource called order risk, and I'm going to access this thing called order risk. And this is something that we see um, fairly widely adopted across some APIs that you may be aware of. Um, for example, MailChimp, if you want to access the email resource, you do so at the automations resource. And they've baked that right into their navigation as well, where you can drill down into their left-hand navigation under automations and get to the endpoint calls that are specific to emails. Here's one from eBay, where again, you can see that the whole way that they've structured their navigation is around surfing, servicing the concept of resources and sub-resources. So this was great, and I thought that we would just take this pattern and we would apply it throughout all of our documentation, and we would be very happy. But like with a lot of things with technology, there's all these corner cases that came up. So for example, we have in our API a resource called price rule, and you can access discount codes from price rules. So that would have dictated, if I was going to follow the same um, rule, that we would have had in our navigation price rules, and then underneath that, discount codes. But then I also found that you could access price rules directly from the admin route of our API. Now, the admin is the place where merchants can go and configure their, their Shopify stores. It's, it's, a, it's a UI where they can go in and um, create their products and, and manage their inventory and all of that kind of stuff. So that gave me pause for thought. I thought, well, OK, where should I surface this in the API documentation? Should I surface discount codes at the top level, or should I surface it as a, as a child resource? I really wasn't sure. And then there were some other resources that were pr problematic for, for different reasons, like product resource feedback. When we started out with resource feedback at Shopify, it was an admin, it was at the admin level of, res uh, of resource feedback. Then as we moved forward, we started enabling developers to access resource feedback on other resources, such as, such as products. So I applied the same, the same rule to how we were going to surface it in our navigation, but it just kind of, it just looks a little bit unwieldy. And then um, more than that, I had people that were working in dev relations and developer experience that were actually working in the front lines with our partners, and they were saying things like, well, our partners, uh, and internally, we always just call it product feedback. Why don't we just call it product feedback? And at the time, I was really, you know, kind of trying to stick hard and fast with my rules. And I was like, no, we have to, if we're going to, you know, have a space and be consistent, then it really does have to be product, space, resource, no space, feedback. Um, but these types of things, these kind of mental models um, are something that you need to keep in mind. And sometimes these mental models are actually related to the needs of the business and the business considerations of your API. Because at the end of the day, you know, the API is just a way of accessing the data to make something happen so that you can make a developer happy or, or make an end user happy. So for example, at Shopify, we 
you can build all kinds of different apps that will, that will plug into Shopify using our, our API. But we also have a very specific type of app, which is called a sales channel. And if you want to build a sales channel, there's a specific set of APIs that, that you can use to do so. And so it made sense for us from that business perspective to simply group all of those uh, API endpoints under sales channels rather than playing hard and fast and making sure that you know, we, we only put them underneath their parent resources and, and we're very consistent. Um, that kind of went out the window in, in this case. So be, be kind of mindful of, of these kind of mental models and organizational considerations and, and product marketing considerations that will also come to bear in the documentation. So, after all of this additional complexity that I, that I hadn't counted on, did anything work for us? Anything? <laughs> anything at all? Bueller? <laughs> well, we did come up with some, some, some rules that I was kind of happy about. So we did use Upper Camel Case, but we decided to only use it if we were going to specifically be um, talking about resources or objects. If we were discussing the, the business case that these things enabled, we would um, do away with that and simply use sentence case. It was a lot less uh, cluttered, a lot more easier to read, and um, it just enabled us to be clear and consistent in the way that we worked. We didn't pluralize resource names when they were written in upper camel case. Instead, we used a convention where we would talk about resources or, or objects and pluralize those things. We decided to not use the word endpoint. We, 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 we opted to use resources instead. This may be the kind of thing where for your API, it may, might make sense to use the word endpoint. Uh, and if so, then go ahead and, 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 and do that. But I do think it's important to kind of develop your own house style. Um, these types of different uh, usages, they're not incorrect. It's just a question of, of committing and, and being consistent and choosing one that works for you. Indicate sub-resourcing, but understand the limits, and be mindful of the mental models within your organization that are going to impact the way that you describe your APIs. All right, on to style guides and the perils of not writing with a style guide. Don't do it. It will hunt you down. It will chase you down, and it will kill you. <laughs> um, so my method when I first started out going back to that, that first issue that we saw earlier in the talk, was that I wanted to um, do my due diligence and put on my best practices hat, and any time that I had to document something and I wasn't quite sure what to do, I would go out into the world and look at all the luminaries of API documentation that had come before me, and they would sort of shine the way for me. So I would, I would go onto the Twilio's of the world, the Stripes of the world, you know all the, all the great docs. And that was great, I always found amazing stuff there to help me. But the problem with that is that if you're taking a little bit from here and a little bit from there and a little you know, sprinkling of spice from over there, then your API, doc, API docs, they don't have a unified voice and, tone, vo voice and tone, and they're kind of a hodgepodge of everybody else's things. And also, as your team starts to grow and you have more writers, uh, junior writers, writers that are at different levels of experience with APIs, everyone kind of has their own way of going about writing things. And so you really start to get into a bit of a muddle um, really, um, really quickly. So some of the stuff that, that worked for us, we decided to go with uppercase ID. There's so many ways that you can talk about IDs. Um, you know, ID, 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 ID. Everyone has their own way of doing it. Try to be consistent. I mean, I think this goes back to what is the actual thing in the API, the stuff of the API that the developer is actually going to be interacting with. In this case, it's collaboration underscore waitlist underscore item flat underscore ID, right? So, and in the heading, it's uppercase ID and then it's lowercase there. This, I mean, I think for me, I, I'd get like, it would be a bit misleading for me. I'd be like, if it's, in, if it's in lowercase ID, I'd think maybe that was meant to be like the actual name of the parameter itself and I'd be interacting with that, but I'm actually interacting with that thing. Half time, okay, cool. Good to know. Um, articles, like, you see this all the time in APIs where sometimes they start with a the or an an and then other times they don't. Um, so it's like these are little details, but it's really amazing in API documentation how many little details there are and how quickly these things add up. We just decided to always have articles. So whenever we are documenting properties or attributes, we just always start with an article. Booleans. There, it turns out there's so many different ways to, to set yourself up to describe 
what a Boolean is, like what an on and off state is. Just pick one way to, to set up how you're going to describe a Boolean and then stick to it. So for example, here's an example. Sometimes has the value true if whether or not, there, there's so many ways you can do it. Valid values. Again, there's a million ways to set up a list of something, right? To say, okay, I'm about to give you a list of possible values here. Find one way to set that list up and then stick to it. There's some examples of that. Properties or, or attributes. I, I notice this a lot in the API documentation space. There's like more than one way to say the same thing. In Swagger, objects are comprised of properties. In API Blueprint, attributes are comprised of, um, or sorry, objects are comprised of attributes. Um, so just aside, it, it just so happens that at Shopify, we talk about resources and properties. Other APIs, it makes make, make, make perfect sense to talk about attributes instead. So um, ultimately, this comes down, as, as Mr. Billy Joel said, to it being a matter of, uh, of trust. So taken individually, these things might seem a little bit pedantic, but overall, you have this surface area of trust that you're sort of like eroding slowly over time by your developers. Like they might, might not tell you this, they may not like specifically open an issue in your repo to be like, you're inconsistent with your articles, <laughs> but <clears throat> they're in those docs, they're seeing them. And if like patterns are really important in, in software development, they're always trying to find the most efficient patterns and um, establishing consistency in how they're coding. If they look in your documentation and you haven't taken the time to establish your own patterns, and then stuck to those patterns, it just kind of seems like careless a little bit. So yeah, do try to uh, consider trust, keep that top of mind. A little bit about uh, GraphQL for those of you that might have to encounter um, GraphQL backed APIs in your organization. It just so happens that the terminology is just a little bit different. Like we don't talk about resources in GraphQL, we talk about types more often. We don't like retrieve or get data, we query it, we don't. Um, create or post data, we, we, we have mutations. Oh, you do send post requests into GraphQL APIs, but you're, you're, the mutation is the word. Um, we talk more about fields rather than properties or attributes. We pass in using arguments as opposed to query parameters. So when I first started out writing the style guide, I wanted to have one simple, clean style guide, you know, one, one style guide to, to rule them all and Maybe we would use some caveats and, and call-outs along the way um, for things like GraphQL. But it really quickly materialized that there was enough that was substantially different about documenting a GraphQL API and a REST API that we just went with two separate sections uh, in order to do so. OK, so a little bit about the, uh, the playbook that we took to get here. Definitely research best practices. Go check out what everybody is doing. but. Make sure you end up deciding on your on your own house style. You know this is not going to be the way that everyone has to document their APIs. This is something that will work for you. You can even go ahead and and, pub, and, and publish this publicly and just say this is our house style. This works for us. If it if it's helpful to you too, then that's great. But that's not sort of the point here. Is not to kind of try to win the uh, docu documenting APIs game. Um, find examples of other style guides. This is maybe more of a uh, pro tip, is that often you'll find in API design guides, there's a section on documenting APIs, and there's quite a lot of API design guides um, available. And so that was a, that was a great way. I, used, I would get stuck on a lot of things, then I would go and check out various API design guides and, and see if there was any little nuggets about documentation in there. And then kick the tires. So for us, this meant our, our developers. We opened up a Google Doc and just started madly dumping everything into a Google Doc, and then we just started sharing that. We work pretty closely with a team at Shopify called the API Patterns Team, and again, their, their job is to sort of um, help ensure like consistent patterns in terms of how APIs are, are coded at Shopify, and so when developers are adding new properties or attributes or new things into the API, they write the description, and it's a lot easier for us if they have some kind of writing guideline that they can look at, and they like it too, you know, they, they don't want to just write something that's going to have to be completely rewritten. It's much better to be able to go in and open a PR that just cleans up a few things rather than like rewriting everything. I find that can sometimes demoralize developers because they think that they're never going to get it right. So by creating a style guide, you're actually doing a great uh, internal service for your company and you're, you're sharing knowledge and you're kind of 
helping to bridge that gap between engineering and development and technical writing. <clears throat> and then publish. So for us, this meant GitHub. It's the closest thing to the code. It's the closest thing to our developers. All right, big, exciting, motivational ending. Um, so when I started off on this, on this path about two years ago, I think I had this idea, maybe because it was a bigger company and I'd, I'd come from like the startup world, um, that there was gonna be all of these all-knowing seers of API information and that you know, they would kind of hold my hand and lead me down the well-lit path towards uh, mastery. But that didn't really end up being the case. Uh, <laughs> I often found that I was poking around in the dark, looking for clues, feeling a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, and really feeling like, am I the only person that cares about this stuff? And it kind of hit me eventually that like, you know, the developer's role is to ensure the accuracy of the API, that it actually works. And then you have develop, developer evangelists and product marketers and all these people whose job is to kind of sell the APIs and make, you know, make them seem sexy and all that kind of stuff. But like the job of the writer is to ensure that the APIs are documented consistently and efficiently and to actually like love the API documentation. So, and it's cool, you know, you're in charge of the, of the style of your document, you know, of, of your APIs and how they like, how they reflect to the world. So, you know, you, I feel like a little bit of a style king now. <laughs> so yeah, go out into the world and, and be your own style king and, and make your own style guide. I hope that this talk has been uh, useful to you. You can reach me at Andrew J Tech across all the usual stuff. Um, that's me and Matilda playing some keyboards. Um, and I also run a um, Write the Docs Canada meetup at Shopify um, every month. And we have um, presenters, that come, sorry, presenters that come on site. And we also have remote presentations. So if there's anything about API stuff or documentation or anything that you're, that you're burning to talk about, we'd love to have you as a remote presenter. Or if you'd like to travel, then you can come and, and see us at Shopify. And we'd love to have you. So thanks very, very much for your time. <laughs>